This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Even though we're not able to gather together as a church family, today is still a day that the Lord has made. And today is still a day that we can celebrate and rejoice. And so I welcome you to Chandler Reformed Church and our morning worship. It is very good that we can gather together, even if it is online, but we still gather together in spirit and in truth. A few announcements. Coming up on July 28th, that is a Tuesday, there is a blood drive at First Reformed Church in Edgerton. Now there will be announcement on our Facebook page with more details about who to call and how to set up an appointment. But with this current epidemic that we're going through, there is a greater need for blood and plasma. Granted, there's always a need for blood, but I do encourage you to give the Red Cross a call or to contact Betty at First Reformed Church in Edgerton to schedule an appointment and give blood. And as many of you know, here in Chandler, the coronavirus is making its way through our homes. I am thankful that many of us have gotten healthy and that we have a clean bill of health from our doctors. I just praise God for, for the health that he gives. I am thankful for those who are currently getting better, that even though they still have symptoms and still suffer from coronavirus, that they are getting better and getting more healthy every day. Let us also praise God for his faithfulness. But there are still many who are sick, who have gone to the hospital. Let us remember them today and pray that God will give them strength and healing in this very tough trial. And with that, brothers and sisters, I invite you to join in a responsive call to worship. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Let us begin our worship by singing number 510, Heaven Came Down, verses 1 and 2.
continue to worship our Lord by singing number 715, He is Jehovah, verses 1, 2, and 3. peace of Christ be with you all. As the Lord has welcomed you, so turn to those you are with and pass the peace of Christ to them. Now that we have greeted one another, let us join together in a confession of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the grave, the Lord has risen indeed. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 
At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And we are his witnesses. The forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses. The resurrection of the body. And we are his witnesses. And the life with God, which lasts forever. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Just as we confess our faith, let us also go before the Lord and make a confession. Will you please join me in a prayer of confession? Righteous God, you have crowned Jesus Christ as Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him and are slow to acknowledge his rule. We give allegiance to the powers of this world and fail to be governed by justice and love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Do not weep. See, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. With his blood, he has purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He has made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. And all God's people say, amen. As a hymn of thanks and praise, let us sing number 706, Thy Loving Kindness. reading today is Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 56. Before we read, let us go to God and ask him to illumine our reading today. Holy God, I pray that you will send us your spirit to illumine our reading today. I pray that we will be filled with your wisdom so that we can understand your word and to grow and produce good fruit. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Mark chapter six, starting at verse 14. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested. <clears throat> and he had him bound and put in prison. 
He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl, at once the girl hurried in to the king with a request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Then the king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately set an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. He's, they said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples and set to set before the people. He also divided two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. This is the word of the Lord. Many of us in Chandler have gotten sick over the past few weeks. I myself have just gotten healthy, and I'm happy to report that everybody I'm aware of is also getting better. Hopefully over the next few weeks, we will have worked our way through this time of sickness, and we can go back to normal. 
But what does it mean for us to go back to normal? While I am thankful that nobody in and around Chandler has died from the coronavirus, the truth is that many people we know have died from something. People have died in accidents, from various forms of cancer, heart disease, mental illness, and many other disease diseases. There has never been a year when someone has not died. Death is a part of our normal life. While death might be part of our physical life, certainly death is not part of our culture. Certainly our civilization can guard us against death, right? No. The recent riots in our cities it has caused much abuse and death. Humans are capable of creating much chaos and violence. But let's not forget that the spark of these riots was that an American citizen died while in the hands of a police officer, a representative of our law and order. Whether humans represent law and order or anarchy and chaos, it seems that death, again, is part of our normal life. And that's not to mention all the normal crimes and the normal wars that people wage every year. Now, an observer of human life might say that before a person was born, they were nothing, and that after a person dies, they return to nothing. In other words, death is our beginning and our end. And when we are alive, it seems that death cover, covers over normal human life. An observer of human life might then conclude that death is the normal human condition and that there is no hope in life. As Christians, we confess that Jesus is Lord. But if death overshadows our life, what do, what do we mean when we say that Jesus is Lord? Just who exactly is Jesus? And what power does he have to change our human condition and conquer death? To answer these questions, let us take another look at Mark chapter 6. Starting at verse 14, King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others say he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. Verses 14 through 16 are a series of answers to the question, who is Jesus? This is, not, this is not a question being asked by a Sunday school teacher or academics in a seminary. This is a question being asked by the common and the powerful people of the world. It is not a question being asked in the safe, clean space. Rather, it is a question being asked in the dirty, messed up world caused by human greed, violence, envy, lust, and sin. Everyone is asking, who is Jesus? Everyone has an answer, and everyone is wrong. Nobody understands Jesus. As I've mentioned in the past, Church history tells us that the gospel according to Mark is based upon a sermon series preached by Peter while in Rome. While we don't know exactly when this happened, the theory that makes the most sense to me is that the book of Mark was created during the reign of Emperor Nero. This would be before Nero started persecuting Christians, but even in the best of times, Nero was not a nice person. He managed to become emperor by killing all his rivals. He also has a strange, incestuous relationship with his sister, which does not make him popular with the people. Nero maintains his power with bribes and by throwing lavish parties for the elites. And he is also willing to kill anyone he believes is a rival. This is all common knowledge for Peter and for the people listening to him in Rome. They all know that anyone, for any reason, might be killed by Emperor Nero. I bring this up because in verse 16, Peter tells us a story about King Herod. Hopefully, right next to me, you are able to see a political map of the Holy Land during the time of Jesus. 
The three colored areas you see are the lands ruled by the surviving sons of King Herod the Great. Archelaus rules the brown area, which is Judea, where Jerusalem and Bethlehem are. Philip took over this red region on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And Antipas, who would change his name to Herod, would rule Galilee, which is the blue area in the middle. Now you might also notice a second blue area. Antipas, who is called Herod, gained this land because he married the princess of Nabatea, which is a kingdom in the bottom right corner of this map. When the three brothers gained power, they had to make a trip to Rome in order to acknowledge that Caesar is their boss. Now, while in Rome, Herod Antipas fell in love with brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and the two caused a big sex scandal. This would create one war and also many rumors of war. Because of the sex scandal, Herod Antipas divorces the princess of Nabatea and sends her back to her father. He then sends troops to reclaim that second blue area. Herodias then divorces her husband Philip and goes to be with her new lover, Herod Antipas. So now there is threat of civil war between Herod and Philip. Because of these divorces and sex scandal, people are fighting and dying. And in the middle of all this is John the Baptist. John has not only called the poor people to repent, he also calls the rich and powerful people of Israel to repent. He tells Herod that sleeping with his brother's wife is wrong and that it is causing much violence and death. Now, while Herod is willing to listen to John, he isn't willing to repent, and so he has John arrested. Herod seems to believe that John is a prophet. There is something about John's message which intrigues Herod, even though his wife Herodias wants John dead. Now remember, Herod is willing to risk two wars for the sake of his wife, but he is not willing to kill John the Baptist for her sake. During this time, King Herod Antipas throws a big party for all the important people of Galilee. <clears throat> During this party, the daughter of Herodias dances and pleases Herod and his guests. Now please remember, this girl is Herod's niece and his stepdaughter, and she dances in such a way to, as to please the powerful and probably drunk men of Galilee and her stepfather. This is incestuous and should make you feel a little weird. Her dance is pleasing, and so Herod makes a drunk oath, promising to give her whatever she wants up to half his kingdom. Herod probably expects that the girl will ask for riches and luxuries, but something much more shrewd happens. The daughter asks her mother, Herodias, what she should ask for. Now let's put ourselves in the shoes of Herodias for a moment. She is a queen, a rich and powerful woman, but she is on shaky ground. She has divorced her first husband, and John the Baptist is advocating that her second husband send her away. If she is divorced a second time, then it is unlikely that a third king will marry her. She will lose her position of power and privilege. And what does she do when her power and privilege is threatened? She does what Nero and Herod would do. She kills. She tells her daughter to ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. If John is dead, then she is certain that Herod, her second husband, will not divorce her. This is the reality in Israel, the Holy Land, the land that God has given to his chosen people. It is a holy land, but it is a land full of greed, violence, envy, lust, and everything else that causes people to become unclean. This is also the reality in the city of Rome, which is called the Eternal City, the city which rules all the other cities of the world. Rome is also full of greed, violence, envy, and lust. Death seems to hover over everything. Let's be honest, 
there is nothing new underneath the sun. Everywhere we look, we can see human greed, violence, envy, lust, and death seems to hover over it all. When we look at the passage that we read today, which is, again, Mark chapter 6, 14 through 56, we notice there are three stories. The first story is 14 through 29, which is the story about the murder of John the Baptist, which is told to explain the question everyone is asking, who is Jesus? This third story is verses 45 through 56. This is the story of Jesus walking on water. I will soon get to the second story, but I first want us to look at the similarities between the first and the third story. Now, I'm sure that all of you are well aware of the story of Jesus walking and calming the storm. On the surface, there do not appear to be any similarities between these two stories. But remember that all these stories are being told in response to the question, who is Jesus? Herod doesn't understand Jesus, and the crowds misunderstand Jesus as well. And in verse 51, we read that the disciples were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. This is amazing. We expect that, here, we expect that Herod would not understand Jesus. He was a thoroughly depraved human being. But the disciples... Men who walk with Jesus, who are able to ask him anything and are taught by him personally, they also don't understand Jesus. Even more shocking is that Peter explains that they don't understand because their hearts are hard. Peter is not just talking about the disciples as if they were people over there. No. Peter is talking about himself and about his closest friends. Peter is confessing to us all that his heart was hard, and that is why he didn't understand. What Peter is doing is explaining why nobody understands Jesus, and he explains in a way that is clever, humble, and very powerful. Peter confesses that his hard heart prevented him from understanding Jesus, and Peter intends that we use this explanation for why the normal and the powerful people of the world also were not able to understand Jesus. It was because their hearts were hard. But Peter does not intend that we stop there. Peter's confession is also an invitation for us to make a similar confession. Now, if Peter the leader of the church, is able to confess that his heart was hard, then that gives all Christians the freedom to make the same confession. This should encourage us to ask the Holy Spirit for help. And God be praised. The Holy Spirit will help us if we ask for help. We can ask the Holy Spirit to show us the spots that are still hard in our own hearts. We can ask the Holy Spirit to remove the rocks from our soil we can ask Jesus to help us overcome our unbelief and to open our eyes and ears so that we may more completely understand and believe in him. And when our understanding and belief in Jesus grows, then we are able to produce more fruit in the kingdom of God. And so with humble hearts and minds, let us continue to dig deeper into Mark chapter 6. Now, I mentioned that the first and the third stories have many similarities. The first is that both, the first is that in both, nobody understands Jesus. The second similarity is that both stories have a storm. Now, the third story has an actual physical storm. The wind and the waves are a natural form of chaos and violence, which threaten the lives of the 12 disciples. Whereas, the storm, whereas this storm is caused by nature, our first story today is a storm caused by human sin. Peter tells us about the death of John the Baptist. Peter tells us that the death of John the Baptist was caused by the chaos and violence of human sin. It is a storm of human greed, lust, violence, and death. 
Now, the physical storm at the end of today's passage just threatened the lives of the 12 disciples. But the storm caused by human sin threatens the lives of everyone. Jesus calmed the physical storm, and Peter is also claiming that Jesus is able to calm the storm of human sin and death. Now, the storm of human sin and death threatened the lives of every human. The question we should be asking ourselves is, how does Jesus calm the storm? The answer to that question is found in the second story. From verses 30 to 44, we are told the story of how Jesus feeds the 5,000. This story is told under the shadow of John the Baptist's murder and the question, who is Jesus? Additionally, this story helps us see how Jesus calms the storm of human sin and death. Verse 30 begins with the apostles gathering around Jesus. Now, if you will recall, Jesus has sent the disciples out to teach the people, to drive out demons, and to heal the sick. Now the disciples return and report everything they did. They are tired and weary, and so Jesus brings them to a quiet place in order to rest with him. <sighs> but there is no rest for the weary. The people of the towns and the countryside see Jesus, and they run after him. Jesus sees that they are a sheep without a shepherd. And now we learn a little bit more about who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? Jesus is a man who has compassion for people who are lost and don't understand who he is. Phrased another way, Jesus is grace. The disciples, I imagine, are sick and tired of all these needy people. The disciples want rest and some time alone with Jesus. And they come up with a perfect excuse for why Jesus should send the people away. Jesus! <laughs> Jesus! They say, this is a remote place and it's very late. Send the people away so that they can go and buy themselves some food. Now, on the surface, this is not a bad reason to send the people away from Jesus. But remember that Peter confesses that the disciples did not understand Jesus because their hearts were hard. The disciples do not have a pure motive for sending the people away. And so Jesus teaches the, the disciples an important lesson about who he is and what their job is supposed to be. Jesus tells them, you give them something to eat. The disciples complain that this would take more than half a year's wages. They, rightly, are telling Jesus that they, that they can't do what he asks them to do. Based upon their own resources, skills, and understanding, the disciples can't feed all these people. It's impossible. Now, Jesus, of course, knows that it's impossible for the disciples to feed the people. But that's the point. He wants them to be aware of their own limitations, and he does this in order, to, in order to prepare them for the lesson he is about to teach. Jesus instructs the disciples to gather all the food that they have, and they return with five loaves of bread and two fish. This might be enough to feed the twelve, but it obviously isn't enough to feed the large crowd. But that doesn't stop Jesus from doing something amazing. Jesus instructs that the people gather into groups and sit down. And so the people do. Jesus then took the bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and then gave it to his disciples for them to give to the people. I hope this story is reminding you of something, because what Jesus does here is almost exactly what he does in the upper room at the Last Supper. In both situations, Jesus takes bread, gives thanks, breaks the bread, and then gives the bread to his disciples so that they may eat and share the bread of Jesus with all the people. And this is exactly what we are supposed to do whenever we partake of the bread and the cup of Jesus. It is important to remember that Jesus is doing this through and for people who don't understand him. He is doing this for people who have hard hearts. The disciples don't understand Jesus and their hearts are hard. 
and yet Jesus uses them to feed the people. He uses the disciples to be instruments of his grace. And let's not forget, the people Jesus is giving grace to also don't understand him. They also have hard hearts. This makes the grace of Jesus all the more powerful. This also shows us that the only way for the disciples to follow Jesus' command to give them something to eat is if they first go to Jesus in order to receive bread. The bread that Jesus gives the disciples is a physical representation of the spiritual bread that Jesus gives to the world. Just as the disciples had to go to Jesus in order to receive the physical bread, so also they must go to Jesus in order to receive his spiritual bread, which is the bread of heaven. Who is Jesus? And how does he calm the storm of human sin and death? Jesus is the bread of heaven, and he calms the storm by feeding the people. The people we read about are part of this fallen world, and they were looking for physical healing, physical bread, and just as importantly, they're looking for physical power to resist the Romans and to establish a worldly kingdom. Jesus does give them physical healing and bread, but it is important to remember that all the physical miracles that Jesus performs does nothing to calm the storm of human sin and death. Even if Jesus were to fight the Romans and establish an earthly kingdom, this would do nothing to calm the storm of sin. Unfortunately, the people and the disciples don't understand this. Their hearts are hard. They don't understand that Jesus is not, in, is not on earth in order to establish a political earthly kingdom. No, Jesus is here in order to establish the kingdom of God. Jesus is not here in order to defeat the Herods and the Neros of the world. No, Jesus is here in order to defeat the forces of sin, Satan, and death. Jesus does this by giving grace to people who are dead in their sins, by giving grace to people who have hard hearts and who don't understand him. And just as importantly, Jesus does this by having his disciples share with others the riches that Jesus gives to them. This is completely opposite from how the world works. The people of this world will do anything, even kill, in order to gain more power, wealth, and sex. This is the storm caused by human sin and death. And Jesus calms this storm not by taking life, but by giving life. He calms the storm not by grabbing more power, but by sharing the power and wealth of heaven with the people of the world. This is the lesson that Jesus wanted his disciples to learn, and this is the lesson that Jesus wants us to learn. Now, brothers and sisters, take heart. This was a lesson that the disciples did not learn right away, but Jesus still kept them around. Jesus kept giving them more grace. In fact, the only way for the disciples to learn this lesson was if they stayed closer to Jesus and received more grace. They could, only, they could only learn this lesson by eating enough of the bread Jesus gave them. Now, if you examine yourself today and find that your heart is still hard, be encouraged. You are in the same boat as Peter and all the disciples. Take heart. Jesus is walking through the storm in order to be with you. He is coming for you. So take his bread, eat your fill, and be satisfied. This is how Jesus calms the storm of human death and sin. This is how Jesus brings us into the kingdom and gives us life. And this is how we are able to fulfill Jesus' command to feed the people of the world. Now, I realize that it is a bold claim that Jesus is able to calm the storm of human sin and death. The, war, the world is full of natural disasters and diseases like the coronavirus. And all of these things together kill millions of people every year. I also realize that there are still many Herods and Neros in our world. 
human greed, violence, envy, lust, and sin still cause much death. It seems foolish to claim that Jesus calms these storms. But that is what makes this claim so powerful. Claiming that Jesus is Lord does not magically make our lives easy or make us immune to death. Now, Peter himself will be martyred for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when we eat our fill of the bread of Jesus, when we proclaim him as Lord, what we are doing is freeing ourselves from the shadow of death. We no longer cling to our feeble wealth and power. We no longer are willing to kill and able in order to protect our prestige and wealth. Rather, we share the fantastic wealth and power of heaven with others. We are willing to share our positions of prestige and power in the kingdom of God with others in order to gain more life. We acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, even when threatened with violent death, because we know that Jesus is the, because we know that Jesus is the beginning and the end. Death is not our end. Our end is to share in the eternal life of Jesus Christ. That is the bread which we are supposed to eat. That is the bread we are supposed to share with the people of this world. So take, eat, and share this bread and discover the amazing power of Jesus to calm the storms of your life. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. As a hymn of response, let us sing number 707, He Giveth More Grace. As we continue to worship together online, let me remind you of the three ways that you can give. For those of you who live in Chandler, you of course can bring your offering to the Chandler State Bank, or you can mail your offering to the church itself, or drop it off if you happen to be walking by. For those of you who are more comfortable giving online, there is a link below where you can give your offering 
through our web app. And with that, let us join together in prayer. Holy Father, creator of heaven and earth, Holy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and Holy Spirit, our comforter and our friend, I thank you, Holy Trinity, that you have called us and made us to be part of your family. I thank you for the many good gifts that you give us, for the sunshine and the rain, for parents and for children, for family and friends. I thank you for the town that we live in and this country that we are part of. I thank you for the world that we call home. Lord, I thank you that you have provided for all our needs. And I pray, Lord, that you will accept our offerings, that you will accept our first fruits. Receive from us what you have already given us. May our gifts, Lord, be seeds which go and produce abundant fruit that will be an abundant harvest that spreads your kingdom to every corner of this world. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Just as we bring our physical gifts to God, let us also bring to God our prayers. Please, let us join together for prayers of the people. Holy God, you are God from everlasting to everlasting. You are creator of heaven and earth. You have made the sun, moon, and stars. You have made the seas and the mountains and the valleys. You have covered the plains with fruit, and abundant animals. You've created angels to sing your praises in heaven, and you have created us to sing your praises here on earth. I thank you, God, that even though we often stumble and fall away, you always come searching for us. And you pick us up, you call us sons and daughters, and you give us your spirit so that we can sing praises to the name of Jesus and to the glory of your works. Lord, I thank you for this time of summer. I thank you for the continued goodness of your hand in this world. I love to see the plants grow, animals graze in the field, children swimming and riding their bikes. I thank you for a time to spend with grandparents, time to celebrate weddings and new births. But God, I also pray that you will be with us in this time of hardship and shadow. I pray that you will be with our brothers and sisters who are in the hospital, whether it's with coronavirus, cancer, or some other disease. Lord, it breaks our hearts that we can't be with them, that we can't worship together. And I pray that your spirit will heal them and give them comfort. And I pray that we will be able to gather together soon. Lord, I also pray for the heart and soul of our nation as we continue to bicker and argue and fight. I pray, Lord, that you will teach us to be forgiving and gracious as your son Jesus was forgiving and gracious. Teach us to share the good things you have given us with the people who are lost, who are still in darkness. Shine your light through us so that the light of your kingdom can go out to every corner of this world, whether it is here in Chandler or on the other side of our planet. Lord, I pray that you will bless our leaders and politicians and give them wisdom to make wise choices, to make choices that promote peace, health, and healing, 
choices that are in the best interest of our schools, our teachers, our students. Make choices that are they're in the best interest of our farmers and factory workers and business owners. That you also take care of our poor, of the widows and the orphans, for those people who are without hope. I pray, Lord, that not only will our government make good decisions for them, but I pray that you'll fill us with your spirit so that we can share with them the good news of your son and the hope that comes from believing in him and believing his gospel message. Lord, I pray that as we continue to work, that you'll bless our work in your kingdom and that you'll bless our work here on earth. I pray, Lord, that what we do Monday through Sunday will be a reflection of the good things you have given us today. I pray that today we will grow, that we will be renewed, that we will shout praises to your name, and that this will echo throughout the entire week. Continue to watch over us and heal us, to give us strength, teach us to do justice, fill us with love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Let us sing our doxology. the vision of your kingdom, forgiveness and new life, and the stirring of your spirit, so that we may share your vision, proclaim your love, and change this world in the name of Christ. As we go out, let us sing number 499, I will sing the wondrous story. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn to you and give you peace. <laughs>